so I'm going to present the soil data interpretation module in GeoSuite. We just call it for short SDI. My name is Suzanne Lacasse, and I work at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute in Oslo. Uh, I worked there for many years, and I, together with Stefan, over a period of uh, eight years, we share the leadership of the project uh, GeoFuture. The creation of the module, module Soil Data Interpretation, it was a cooperation between Sweden and Norway, where Anders Rosenquist from Trimbul was very active, and then uh, and then um, William also, and then a number of NGI people, and uh, we have gender equality, we so many as many women as there are men, and also the testing was done by a number of companies, uh, Multiconsult, Statensvägvesen, Geovita. Uh, Turens, Sveco, Kowi in Sweden, No Consult in Norway and Sweden, WSP, and by Sintef. So many companies have done many trials of these modules. The Soil Data Interpretation module in GeoSuite. It, GeoSuite is a program for practical geotechnical design. So it, it, it wants to replace what you do every day in a systematic manner and by storing all the data and analysis you do. So the uh, modal calculation which Stefan has presented on stability, settlement, bearing capacity, excavation, slide runout and piles, they have a wizard to help execute the calculation. But there's also a module here, which is the soil data representation in three dimension and the soil data interpretation here, which communicates with all of the calculation modules. And the, the ground observation model, you get a pretty picture in three dimension of what is found above ground and below ground. And there's a location of different piles and the locations of the borings. But how do you determine the soil parameters for analysis when you have this forest of, of boreholes and CPTs and lab tests? And how do you do that in an efficient manner? And how do, how do you track back what you've done a few years later? So to do this, we have this soil interpretation, data interpretation modules. And today I will show you the workflow for establishing the soil parameters. And at the same time, I will show you the application, different graphs that we generate and which you can generate also. And then we'll show you what we did for determining the soil parameter for analysis in two dimensional and three dimensions for the Shegesta bridge in Norway. The vision is not there yet, but we, we have something that works <laughs> well so far. But the vision is that all the data that's generated, the geotechnical data, would be that comes from the laboratory, that comes from the field, and which are stored in some kind of different databases, that the data are assembled and analyzed together in order to generate these profiles. So what we want to do is we want to replace with this module the five or six <laughs> calculation um, calculation sheets that you use in Excel to determine what's the results of the vein shear test, what is the result of the tracks of compression test in the laboratory, and to be, for you to be able to compare the efficiently and then export the result you obtain in either your piggy, yeah, <laughs> uh, drawing files or PDF files, or even Word files or Excel files. Then this information would be transferred to the calculation of settlement or stability or piles, whichever you need to do. And at the same time, we want to provide some assistance we called it the wizard, for, for you to help you make some decisions if you should encounter a very large variation in the soil parameters. So the soil data interpretation module in this representation you shows you the CPTU data, which is the cone penetration test, the laboratory results, measurements of pore pressures in situ, 
and they enter this module in GeoSuite. Uh, you, you can have looked at the data from the CPTU in the presentation module, and or you can go directly into the calculation module and then go and do your calculations. So the workflow, first you establish the interpretation basis. So you, you make the list of borings and then all the borings are entered automatically from the boring, the boring machine in the field. You look or calculate the index parameters. You calculate the effective uh, vertical stress, horizontal stress, if you have a value of K0, and the preconsolidation stress. That's what we call the stress history. What was the past history on that soil? And then you do an interpretation and evaluation of the, of the properties to establish a design profile. So there's a path to do the interpretation of in situ tests, interpretation of laboratory tests, and then to select the design parameters. And the next few slides in my presentation follows these six steps. The GeoSuite contains what we have called a graph library, where it accumulates all the graphics that you make. You can delete them, but if you want to save them, you know, soil mechanics is complex. You need different types of shear strength for different types of problems. You use a different one if you have a slope stability problem than if you're calculating a pile, for example. So you have the, the graph library. You can prepare a report with all your drawings and your consideration. And throughout, you have this user assistant, what we've called a wizard, to help you uh, describe the work that you've done or to make a decision. More illustration on this later. What we put as the top priority was having some flexibility for the graphs or having a very a lot of flexibility for the graphs the tables the trend lines and the user can add data ignore some calculate with all or parts of the data the user can adjust the layer thickness the trend lines prepare several strength profiles for the different calculation as mentioned and he, he can also compare with correlations he believes in. I call them known correlations, but some of them are better than others. And these can be found online. The user assistance is always available online also. However, we made the decision because geotechnical engineering is so complex that the user must himself or herself decide the layering the soil profile and what are the design strengths. So this does not come automatically. You have to draw the line of the strength that you want to use in your calculation. But you get assistance on how to do it. So if I look, for example, yes, okay, the you have a, a number of borings, which I don't show here. But let's say we're looking at an index parameter. Here it's the, I think, yeah, it's the unit weight of a soil. And these, these are all the data that come from the laboratory tests that either come from an Excel file where the, which the laboratory has produced for you or which you have entered yourself. And the blue line is the trend line that you draw yourself. And then the interpretation of the in situ tests and inter laboratory tests will come out with a number of choices with graphs, for example, this is the soil classification as interpreted for the cone penetration test. We will look at that a bit more. But the end product is finding what are the design parameters for the stability analysis or the pile calculation. So in this case, where we still have the unit weight, then the user has drawn this blue curve, which is what we've called the trend line. And here are all the data from different types of borings. This trend line, there's an option here that you call, this is, it's difficult to see, but trend line. And this is what, it's, it's a pen for you to draw on, on your computer. Oops. But uh, one particularity, yeah, I show it here, but it applies to all of the soil parameters. You can do statistical analysis. So there, is a, there are boxes here with different uh, choice where you can set the boundaries where you want to do the calculation. I will show an example. You can select 
and deselect some points if there's a pure spurious point you don't want to consider or it belongs to another layer you will see an example then you can deselect it as we call it and then we have different methods of analysis which i will have in another slide the four methods of analysis is if you have very few data there's a method called shortcut estimates of the standard deviation then the methods of moment that's finding the mean the standard deviation linear regression with a constant variance and a linear regression with a non-constant variance these are the four methods that are included right now these are the, these are the more standard more usual method we did not put the multivariable method that that you can do in excel anyhow but here's an example where we had a layer with uh, an undrained shear strength uh, if i don't tell you how they were obtained first we have this data here and then between three and four meters two very, very low values and here values that resemble the ones on top so you can deselect these values and calculate the mean here and the mean here and then just look at these values and i think that is probably the best interpretation or you can just ignore the point and say this is one layer and then find what is the mean the standard deviation and this was for looking at the triaxial compression data CAUC stands for triaxial compression and here were the data for the um, UU data here you use unconsolidated undrained test the mean plus some minus standard deviation but again you yourself decide which points you want to consider and which ones uh, over which step you want to do an analysis. If I move now to what I call the stress history, part of the stress history is finding what are the effective stresses in the ground. And when you go into this stress history panel, there's a choice of options. So first is just finding the in situ stresses. So here you, I, <laughs> you have the total stress in green, the in situ pore pressure in blue, and the effective stress in red. This is a very typical, <laughs> no artesian pore pressure, I think. Um, but then, this, when you want to calculate the stress history, you need to know what is the pre-consolidation stress. What is the stress that has been experienced in the past in the deposit? So you can move to this panel, which is called uh, odometer interpretation. And here, the here we've come in with the test data that came directly from the laboratory and plotted the data and do, did an interpretation of the odometer test. The methods that are available are shown in the red box, but those to calculate the preconsolidation search is the classical Casagrande method. There's the energy method by Becker, there's a cell force method in, from, in Sweden, and there's a tangent modulus method by Jambu and the one modified by Karlsrud. And I believe this this one was the method by the Karlsrud method. And then you can draw the profile of the preconsolidation stress. The values are shown here with a certain uncertainty because there was uh, you do an evaluation of the sample disturbance and estimate the value of the preconsolidation stress. Now this is when you take do the interpretation directly from the laboratory data. Let's say that you're using a project that has a report from 1980, and then there's nothing digital in there. They're just points that tells you uh, the preconsolidation stress was 200 kilopascal. Well, you can also enter the data in a table, and then these numbers will also be plotted on your graph, either together with the data from the new odometer test or separately, or different symbols. Again, flexibility was the word. Now, if I go to the interpretation of in situ tests, uh, this is a sounding from the cone penetration test, but but we also do the interpretation of the direct soundings. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how it's called in in Norwegian, rotary, rotary sounding, I think it's called. Um, we do the cone penetration test and also the vein shear. And again for these methods different methods of interpretation are available and these are illustrated you cannot read them but illustrated in the red box but here this is one of the interpreted cone penetration tests in terms of undrained shear strength in triaxial compression which is 
it, it's a clay deposit with uh, some sand on top. And you see very well that there are some layers that still have some sand or some more, there's some stiffer material. And naturally, when you want to, inter to choose a shear strength, you look at this value. You don't take into account this value if you're looking at the stability problem, for example. The methods of interpretation uh, for the unrange shear strain from the cone penetration is the these cone factors. Uh, you can define them yourself as a user. Uh, you can choose value that you believe in from the literature. And these are the cone factor NK, NKT is the corrected one, NDU is a pore pressure factor. Or you can use the values that are recommended uh, the, the, in the Carl Sue et al. paper uh, for the corrected cone resistance or for the um, the pore pressure factor. Or you can use the method by Conrad. So three of the methods are, are pre-programmed and the fourth one you can define yourself. In some cases, a very, very stiff clay, maybe you want to use a much higher NK. There are many cases like that. We've also included the method to interpret the overconsolidation ratio, the stress history, from the cone penetration test. As, as you know, it's difficult to find a preconsolidation stress from odometer tests, but there, there are some reasonably good methods with the cone penetration test. So we've included a method to calculate the overconsolidation ratio from the pore pressure uh, parameter, from the value of the normalized cone resistance and for the value of the normalized pore pressure ratio. And then also with the Conrad method. So, so again, it's just uh, choosing on the menu which method you want to use, and then the interpretation is automatically done. You get the profile of the interpreted underrange shear strength and over consolidation ratio. And we, we all know this, this, this is an older graph from 1989 of the Robertson method to interpret the cone penetration test for soil classification. Well, in the, in the soil data interpretation module, you will automatically plot the values of CPT as a function of uh, depth. Depth is shown to the right here. And in order to decide which soil type you have. Now, these uh, diagrams are very useful, but they are not perfect. It's just um, accumulation of experience from before. And it's a, it's a good guideline in order to interpret your soil profile. Um, you can also, in terms of shear strength, you can interpret uh, the values of the laboratory tests. And uh, you can go get the data directly from a file, for example, or from the laboratory tests in the lab. In the lab. Or you can enter a table of the values that ha you have from another report or something that has not come to you in a digital fashion. And then laboratory test data is not like CPT, it's not continuous. And then this is the plot of the values that were measured in the laboratory. Those are in the NGI laboratory. You have the values here of triaxial compression tests, which is always quite a bit higher than the values of the triaxial extension. We, we, we need to have both values because of the strength and isotropy of soil. So here, we, we've come now to the soil profile. Here, you the, the soil data interpretation module has put together the undrained shear strength from the cone penetration test in green, shown here. The undrained shear strength remolded from fall cone tests in the laboratory. You also, I think, yeah, the undrained shear strength from the, the laboratory from an index test like the fall cone is the one in blue, pale blue. And then a number of triaxial extension and triaxial compression tests with the circles in purple and in blue. And then you, as the user, have to draw the line in here to decide what you would like to use as a strength. Now, this value is maybe what is the most representative for that profile, but that might not be the value you use in design. The analysis you do for each of the parameter and to the extent that you want, you, you look, there's the visual inspection, which is always needed. So this you do on your computer. You draw the trend lines. You do or do not the statistical analysis as you wish. And then you will compare with reliable, reliable correlations. I will come back to these. 
And then there's an advice in the online assistant. In online assistant, you just open by clicking and then you open the assistant. It's, it tells you how to select the design parameters. For example, what is found in the code? How is a representative value def defined? That is very controversial today. And uh, when you should do statistical analysis and things of that sort. Naturally, once you've read the assistant once, maybe you don't have to read it again, or maybe there are just some parts you will want to go back to. But it's always wise to go check what is in the codes. And here's a partial table of what you can found, find in the assistance. Is, um, we compile what we call all the correlations which we find are reliable to find different salt parameters. For example, this is the plasticity index or to find uh, the over-consolidation ratio or the sensitivity, clay content or shear strength. Um, and then, for example, um, friction angle, you can obtain that from the plasticity index, from the void ratio, from the relative density, from the clay content, or there, at least there's a correlation about that. So th this table, you can vision and then you can decide which correlation you want to have and then this correlation is is in this book that is online where you can just go and look how it how it appears and whether your data fits in with the published correlation before this is a table for the 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 data from laboratory tests there's a table like that also for the in situ tests but Okay, that is the status of the soil data interpretation today, but we want to do more. We would like to have a perfectly seamless user interface with the interpretation of all the parameters, all lab and in-situ tests, and for different soil types. We have much more on clay and clean sands than we have on mixed soils right now. And today, you have to do the, co the comparison with the uh, correlations you know, you have to go and find the correlation. It it comes out just by with a link, but you have to choose the correlation. We would like to that that to be done dynamically, that it would happen automatically, but that's not there yet. And then we had several testing sessions, and there were many wishes from the testing workshops, which we have kept a copy of, and which will we gradually fix with time. Now. We've looked at the workflow and the application in short terms, and then we're going to show you what we did for the analysis of Shegeta Bridge. The, the Shegeta Bridge had a very important failure. Those of you who remember in 2015, it was completely surprising, and it destroyed the, the landslide here, destroyed this pile, pile loan. And the, the short story is that this part had to be dynamited and replaced. There were no laws, lives lost, which is very fortunate. But and some analysis we do, but we wanted as part as an example with Geo Suite to analyze this failure. And as you see, it's not a plain strain situation. It's really a three-dimensional case. In 2015, there was a report by uh, NVA, Skrede Wimmelf, Mufiel Beckenbrewer, that is, <laughs> that is Shegesta Bridge. Um, and the conclusion is there's the bridge, that the failure scarp started here with number one and progressed with number two and progressed with number three. This was based on images after the slide and different consideration analysis, but all the analysis were made in two dimensions. Um, and here's a cross section showing different slides that were analyzed and all magically came out with a factor of safety of one, which it should not, because when you analyze in two dimensions, a case of three dimension, it should not give one. But the, the situation was made much more complex by this bedrock here that uh, varied a lot in, in the cross section. But if you look here, this is the bedrock contours. They also varied a lot uh, longitudinally. It was found that this section UU was the most critical. And like this one here had a very small thickness of clay because the bed, bedrock was very shallow. 
And, and you know, one section here cannot be representative of everything that happens in the three dimension. And then there was this whole series of undrained shear strength values. All these are in Norwegian. I did not translate them. Um, and how do you choose a value for the strength? Well, maybe a three-dimensional analysis would have been useful. So we decided to use Geo Suite to do a three-dimensional analysis. But I'm just I'm just going to show you how the parameters were selected. So first, we did the zoning of first the CPTU test. There are also vein shear tests. Now I forgot I have a drawing, but the, the bridge is here. Pillar, the pillar that fail is here, bridge axis four. So the that's the direction of the bridge. And then you can see, at least we chose, given the scarp of the failure here, we chose to divide into five zones, what we call north. Remember the bed bedrock varies a lot on the side. East, south, and oh, the one around the bridge which fail, the, the, the pillar that fail, and then uh, this one in the middle. So first we did an interpretation of the CPTU tests that were obtained in each of these five zones. And I, I will not explain this picture, but you see all the data as they were interpreted. So there, there was, it was after the fact, but there was a number of concentration tests available. And then we calculated the statistical value in each of those zones. With, and COV means the coefficient of variation, is the ratio of the standard deviation divided by the mean. So it tells you the uncertainty. It's how wide one standard deviation is of the mean. So the values were about, about 10 to 20% maximum. And but in the crust here, there was a much larger variation, and you see that everywhere. There was much more. Well, here the, there was no measurement in the crust, but there was a wide variation in the the uh, shallower material, and that that's normal. The crust is always very variable. So then we did the comparison of the interpreted interpretation with the CPTU. Here you have in black you have the north or navy blue, pale blue is south, purple is uh, at the landslide location in the middle of the landslide, green is the, at the axis where the pylon failed, and red is on the east side. And you, you see it, it was much, much stronger on that side. So if you think in three dimension, then that part was kind of stopping the landslide because the material is much stiffer, and also there was bedrock. And we all, this also allowed us to look at the soil profile. And so in each of these five sections, we could establish like here the dry cross is only two meters, whereas at the, in the red zone, it's about four meters, five meters in the middle of the landslide and up to three to seven meters near the pylon. And also it, it established also the depth to the bedrock. Now, here's a comparison of the shear strength. Um, the mean of the CPT is shown in blue, dark blue. And then, you know, in when you do a design, you want to be cautious. Maybe you don't want to use exactly the mean value. Maybe you want to use 0.8% of the mean. You don't want to use half of the mean, but maybe 0.8. So we showed that with the pale blue. Uh, and then plus or minus mean standard deviation are the dotted lines. And then we also put the value of 0.35 times the effective stress. This is based on correlations for normally consolidated clay in triaxial compression, uh, not uh, about an OCR of about 1.5, not exactly normally consolidated. So if there had been no cross, the undrained shear strength with that ratio of 0.35 is this green line, which kind of agrees at a certain depth, but not in the top. And then we also showed the shear vein results that were shown here, and they were very variable, but also the shear vein were taken before the construction. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if the data was more varied or the testing was more varied at that time. That was before year 2000. 
And here is the, now, when we did the three-dimensional analysis, we use a shear strength in each of the zone in order to represent the entire distribution over the 3D area. But here is the value that recommended for the 2D analysis to be representative of this cross-section here, which was this mean here, plus or minus one standard deviation. And the standard deviation was about 15% in the more or less normally consolidated clay. But in the cross, we, we thought it was much higher, 0 0.2 and 0.3. This ends my presentation on the soldat interpretation. The results of the analysis in two-dimensional and three-dimensional, we were able to obtain a factor safety in three dimensions of, of uh, 1.05, which is very close to failure. We're still studying ways to understand further what has happened, looking more in detail at the strain softening. But in the two-dimensional analysis, by taking these values, were not equal to one, which is reasonable because when you get the failure of a three-dimensional volume, it should, when you do an analysis with only two-dimensional or assuming it's plain strain, you cannot obtain a factor safety of one. Well, on this word, I, I would thank you very much for your attention.